how a mother's legacy is a lasting one. A mother's legacy. Now, what's a legacy? A legacy means that even when you're not in her sight, even when she's not around, her legacy is in you. It helps you and influences you. And then to our mothers, how do you maintain that legacy and what do you do? Since the beginning of the time, women have contributed outstanding to society, you know, and, and when you look at just just not even maintaining the household, which was the role, main role back in the um, olden days, but then through our history in the, in the modes of education and art and theology, adventure and, and you know, um, inventions, and women are amazing, right? We know that. And we see that in Proverbs 31, it depicts a very strong woman. And it goes through and it details. And we talk about any time you want to talk about the, the, the scripture that really speaks to women, it's Proverbs 31. That's what we go to. And that is good. And we want to raise and we want to take care of home. But I also want you to think about someone else when we talk about women. And that is an individual in the Bible who we, we go to this book all the time. And that's the book of Timothy. And we look at who Timothy is. Timothy, as you know, was, you know, uh, uh, served with Paul. And he was loved by Paul. And he was a recipient of two New Testament epistles, right? Two letters that were written to Timothy that we put a lot of lessons are based on the book of Timothy. He joined Paul's mission trips and um, he was called a true son. My true son in the faith is what Paul called him. He was probably in his late teens and early 20s. Right. When he got started, trusted um, Paul, he served as uh, Paul's representative in several churches and even went on to be the pastor in the church of uh, Ephesus. Right. Timothy is mentioned side by side with Paul in the New Testament. Trusted individual. Now, you think about what we put Paul in our scriptures. Timothy right there is being trusted by Paul. But when we look at how did Timothy get to be where he was? We have to look at his upbringing, and it's hard to divorce Timothy from the way he was brought up. And Paul gives us this in 1 Timothy 1 and 5. The Bible is very clear about how he was inspired by his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, right, or Lois. It says that, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Louise and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now also lives in you. These women are given credit for raising Timothy to become the man that he was by keeping him involved in the word. If we look at 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15, he's telling Timothy, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Notice he didn't say what I taught you, right? Paul taught him a lot, but he wasn't talking about what I taught you. He said from infancy. And we see that his mother and grandmother were there to teach him from infancy. And here it is, he's a grown man, and he's still referencing what he learned in his infancy. So it shows that that role is very important because the building blocks that you put in place matter. They may not always look right as they grow up, and Timothy, I'm sure, wasn't perfect. He's a young man, right? Pretty sure he had his days of different thoughts, and I don't know what he might have done, but he was a human. So I'm pretty sure he went through temptation and all other types of things that we all go through. But here it is, him being super respected by a man of God who is establishing churches and who a lot of what we base our church today on are the words of Paul. And he looked at Timothy in a beautiful light, but he referenced how he was raised. So how we raise our children makes a difference. If you just let them go, there's a 50-50 shot, right? Maybe they find their way, maybe they don't. But when you influence, you give those odds tremendous, right? You flip them because there's so much that matters in your role in their life just with the respect that comes because here it is, I'm in my 40s and my mother still has a huge role in my life. There were some days if I go back a few years where she had a bigger role than I wanted her to have 
right? Like, stop calling me. Leave me alone. But she wouldn't, right? So the role matters. But out of respect, you do what your mother wants. They can reach across state lines. They can reach across county lines and still influence you in your adult age. And even for those of you whose mothers have gone on to be with the Lord, they still influence your life because of the legacy that they instilled in you in raising you. So it matters. Now, when we look at, you know, any mother would have been proud if Paul came to their hometown and grabbed their son to be the next leader. I mean, can you imagine? You've been raising your child and here Paul is Paul who started these churches with aligns with your belief and they pick your son as being the next leader. That would make you proud. When you look at, uh, let's look at first, first Corinthians four seventeen, It says, for this reason, this is Paul talking, for this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So this is telling us that Paul respected Timothy. And imagine how much glorification, if you will, that gave to Eunice and Luis, right? That had to feel good. But it wasn't about that. It was about what it meant for God. When we go back and we look at him and how she gave Samuel to God, right? That's where you're going. You want God to influence that individual. Because we sometimes want to start living our life through our kids. But at some point, we have to let them go and be their own, which is a very hard thing to do. Let's go to 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 5. And I want to move to my next point. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Louise, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So that gives context to all of that, right? It gives context to show how important Timothy was and where his growth started. But how does that translate to us today? So we said your impact is real. Your impact matters, and you have to recognize your impact. But... Does the child always recognize the impact? Because sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes you look at those kids and you want to let them go because of some of the decisions that they make. You wonder if anything is going through. You wonder if anything is happening. You look at them even in their adult years because you had them during their formative years, right? And now in their adult years, you still wonder, is it worth me to continue to nag or to be a pest, if you will, because I can tell they're getting frustrated. But is it worth it? And a lot of times you think about as we grow, the role of the mother kind of changes. The saying goes to a four-year-old, mommy can do anything. To an eight-year-old, mom knows a lot. To a 12-year-old, mom doesn't know much of anything. To a 16-year-old, it's not worth it asking mom because she doesn't even know. To an 18-year-old, mom is just out of date. To a 25-year-old, mom might know a thing or two. To a 35-year-old, it's probably best to to consult mom on the issue. To a 50-year-old, some wish they could consult mom. And to a 70-year-old, they often wonder what mommy would have done about this. The role changes as you get older. That's essentially to say it does matter. Your role matters. The words matter. If they are coming from a place of love. So when you are coming from a place of love, that means you're being led by God, that you're giving your life to God. That's where your witness starts. A lot of people find it easy to talk to strangers. You know why? Because you don't have to deal with their problems. You can talk to a stranger, give them some words of encouragement, talk to them on the phone every now and then, 
But their mess is not your mess. And you can just, okay, do it and walk away. But when you're invested in someone, it takes a lot more because it also takes a toll on you to influence and to help this person and the worry and the concern. You want to let it go, but you can't. And that's what makes it harder. But that is where your witness and your dedication starts from the role of parent and definitely from the role of mother. When we look at moms and grandmoms and what kind of influence and what kind of legacy they are leaving to their children, it matters because how that kid act is a lot of times a reflection of how they were brought up and what they saw and what impacted them and what influenced them. Your influence is broader than you realize. Look at the role of, uh, of, of Jochebed, Moses' mother. Put him in a little basket, let him float down the river. Did what God wanted her to do. That was not easy to let her son go, but she did. And look what became of it. Look at Naomi, how she helped Ruth in her quest and help. That role influenced generations. Look at Mary being obedient to God to birth Jesus into this world. The role of the woman has been really recognized in the Bible. But we have to make sure that what about 2023? What about now? What's the role now? Well, Jesus, he been here. There's no need for a Moses. There's no need for, a, well, I beg to differ. Jesus has already been here, but he also has a legacy that he wants to go through you. And without you listening to him and influencing those who listen to you the most, what will happen? So we have to make sure that our quest lines up with his quest so that we can do what is best for those who are around us. So when we look and we are fully committed to God and all the power that he gives to us, we can do big things. I see, you know, we, we always go through buzzwords and there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, there's a big thing now, girl power, right? And girl power is, 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 is good. And then we got black girl power. Right? And that's beautiful. Black girl magic, right? Now, if you said that back when I was growing up, black magic. Y'all don't remember that. Go a little magic. But anyway, when you think about what it matters, what matters the most, right? When you think about these, these buzzwords, we usually recognize those who have done something, right? Oh, that's black girl magic. That's girl power. And that's great. Let's, let's recognize it. But then what about those who feel like they haven't done much? We recognize those who have done much and they're on stage and we cheer. But then there are people in the audience who cheer and who's wondering, well, I haven't done anything like that. I don't have grades like that. I haven't made an invention like that. I can't sing like that. I can't act like that. What about me? What about my power? What about my influence? And that's an easy question, right? Because we see people who are exalted, but then we wonder, why would somebody tell me I have girl power when I'm not doing anything? I'm doing what I think I'm supposed to do, but what recognition can I get for, for this? Your witness matters. A lot of mothers out there are suffering because they want to influence their kids, to influence those that are around them, but they wonder how. How can I influence when I don't feel like I'm enough? How can I help my kids and my family, my sisters, brothers, whoever around me, when I don't feel worthy enough? When I'm struggling and making mistakes myself? When I really want to say my message is do what I say, not what I do. Because I'm having trouble with my own habits, with my own commitments. I want to take them to church, but I have trouble going to church myself. I want to do more, but I struggle in praying myself. So how can I tell them to do something when I feel like a hypocrite telling them to do something that I'm not even doing? Isn't that a struggle? That's hard. It's hard to feel like, Lord, I don't know how to really pray. So if I'm stuttering through my own prayer, why would I pray in front of my child? 
I struggle with reading the Bible myself, so why would I read it to my child? Because they're going to have questions that I can't answer. I know what I'll do. I'll just take them to church and let them handle it. Or I'll say, don't take prayer out of schools. Why not? Because I need it there because they're not getting it at home. I need society to be perfect because my house ain't all that good. But it starts at home. I've heard it starts at home. But how can it start at home when I don't even feel like it started in me? So what am I supposed to do? Because I'm not this Proverbs 31 woman that I want to be. And my husband is not the Psalms 1 man that he needs to be. So how are these kids going to be Ephesians praise kids if I'm not even doing what the Old Testament wants me to do? That's a struggle. That's a high bar that we put on ourselves. But how do we get there? Well, lucky for you, as always, and in the Bible Christian ministry, the answer is very simple. The answer is very easy. The answer does start with you, but it is not as difficult as you have made your life to be. And all the answer is, is about dedication. It's about commitment, and it's about trying. You just need to try. And you say, well, there's nothing in life that I can get just by trying. Yes, it is. When you put forth effort, you get results. They may not seem like a lot to you, but the impact is huge. And I'll tell you how. I want you to go to Psalms 51 because this is where you start. Psalms 51 is David's song after he had sinned against the house of Uriah after he had went and snatched Bathsheba and he had her husband killed. And David is sitting there after Nathan had came to him, the, the, the prophet Nathan had came to him and told him he needed to repent for his sins. After that, he wrote Psalms 51. And notice God had blessed David in such a way. He had given him so much he had given him the kingship. Along with that came money, came fame, came glory. Now, not only was he a regular king, but he was a king who had defeated, who could not be defeated in Goliath. So now think about your role. You weren't just given a kingship. You took it. And now people looked at you as a god. You were right up there. They had God, but you were pretty close. Because they were like, wow, that's David. We look at David as great today, right? Those many years ago, you think about Jesus, and then after that, you think about Old Testament. Oh, David, Abraham. You can't go without saying David. That was a great man, right? But notice what he says in Psalm 51, starting in verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew your steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit. People, David could have prayed, don't take this kingdom from me. God, I know I sin, but don't take my money. Don't take my fame. Don't take all the glory that these people put on me. I love that. Don't take this beautiful house or my wives or my children. Don't take all this stuff that I've accumulated and worked for over time. Because notice when we fall into trouble, where does our mind go to? I'm going to lose my stuff. I'm going to lose the way people look at me. What about how they perceive me? A lot of people don't come to church because of how they think the congregation going to look at them, especially after they messed up. They don't want to walk through the doors because, oh, they pregnant. Oh, they did something. Oh, somebody found out about something they did, and they're going to get them looks. So they don't come because something has been taken, and they just want the shame to go away. They want the guilt to go away. They want the hurt to go away. A lot of people don't commit because of what people think. It's good as long as things are going good. But as soon as things start going a little rocky, you don't see them no more because 
They don't want things to be removed. But David said, don't take your Holy Spirit. It starts there. When your passion is after God's spirit, because you realize that if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have none of what you had. When your passion is there, I don't care what mistakes you've made and what mistakes you will continue to make. When you're after God's spirit, it influences those around you. How do I know? Because I've seen it. I've seen people who don't have it all together raise some of the best kids. And their house is good because they're after God's spirit. Why? Because they're trying. Because I've seen the impact that it can have. Women aren't not empowered by what society dictates or by their home or by their workplace. Not their friends, by the clothes they put on, by how they look, because that's the world we live in. I feel better about how I look to other people because the people that I see on Instagram or on TikTok or whatever social media platform you may use are not the people that you meet. They don't look like that. They don't act like that. They don't have that because everything is a filter. The way they look is a filter. The money a lot of times that they spread out across the bed one, it ain't even a Sealy's mattress that they spreading it out on. And that's all they money. And they showing it to you. This is everything I got. Look at how important I am. It's not about that. Because if you can spread that money, the room should have been cleaned by the maid. That's the way I look at it. Why right? your bed ain't made when you spend that money. But it's about how do I look to you? I'm validating myself through your eyes. And as long as you think I'm good, then I must be good. But that's not what it's all about. It's about not letting God's spirit get away from you. It's about making sure that you seek his spirit first in everything that you do. Because the way that you are, who you are, is what he designed. And the impact that you have on those lives, those young lives, because they're always going to be young to you because you're going to keep getting older, right? So those young lives that you have impact on are going to be great. It's hard to see. I know. I know it's difficult to imagine sometimes that how great your kid can be, but they can be great. I'll tell you, when I, when I look back over time, because a lot of kids came through our youth, right? And I like using other people's testimony, too. But when I look at some of the youth, they went through some rocky years, some of them. But then a lot of them grew up to be great kids, great young adults. I look at Chris and Brent. Ain't seen them in I don't know how long. And then we had the service the other day. These are great young men. And I know they mama because she's my cousin. And I know the struggles that you went through dealing with your own stuff. But look at what you did. Look at them great young men. And if any of y'all know, it's hard to raise young men, right, to stay focused. Now, don't get me wrong, they went through some times. It's like, man, what, what are you doing? I don't know what he's doing. And then they come back around. And you see it. It's nothing that you can fake. Because, see, here's what y'all got to understand. I, you know, out of this lesson, this, this is what I hope you get. When you seek God's spirit for yourself, it's not about other people. This, this is easy. Church is easy. It's easy to flip on a church switch. All you got to do is put on some decent clothes, and you can be quiet and as long as you sit there and nod your head and open your Bible and just look astute, right? Oh, you look like you a Christian. You're doing the Christian thing. But what about when you go home and you walk through that front door and the door closed behind you, what y'all ain't cleaned up? And then them words start coming out and all this. Hey, what happened to that Sunday school lady? That was just talking to Sister Jenkins and talking about the Lord is good. Yes, he is. My and my Savior, Lily of the Valley, bright and morning star. I first give honor to God, head of my life, to my pastor and to my bishop. And then you get home. If only the pastor and bishop could see who gave first honor to God to him and him. Just because some dishes weren't clean. 
Mama got an arm. She threw that pot straight into the living room. But you have to think of who you are. Because if you're seeking God first, no, you may not be perfect. But you are trying. And I mean, when I tell you, when your kids see somebody who's trying, and they trying, and they slip and they try again, you think they don't notice effort? You think they don't see God, someone after God's own heart? Do you notice how we use David as the ultimate example of what it's like to praise the Lord, to dance for the Lord, to honor the Lord? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you know how many psalms we have in frames that we have around our house? And this is the psalm of David. This is also the man who had another man killed so he could take his wife. This is also a man who did that, who had everything. Everything, everything. He didn't need anything. He walked out up on his palace, which sat above everybody else's house, and noticed this man's wife and wanted his wife. Notice he had wives in the same house downstairs of his choosing. But he wanted that lady. And he went through all that to get her. And didn't even think that he was doing anything wrong. Then went to cover himself by, let's bring this man back so he can sleep with his wife. And that way it won't look like I did anything. But when the man said, no, nah, my men out there dying, I can't lay in here with my wife. I'm going to sleep out here in the yard. They were like, God, an honorable man. So a good man, he said, put him on the front line so he can be killed. And we're honoring this person? Us? That's what we're doing? Yes. Because why? Look at what he did. He said he laid all that down. Lord, don't let your spirit go from me. And God didn't. So you mean to tell me your life, the things that you've done, the mistakes that you've made, the errors of your ways are not forgivable? You mean to tell me that the efforts of you trying to please God? Because if you read Psalms, it's all about trying. The Psalms is all about, Lord, do not forgive me. Lord, don't turn your back on me. Lord, do not forsake me. Lord, do not let my enemies come against me. Please, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord. I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying, Lord. You got a whole book. The biggest book in the Bible is about somebody trying. So your trying makes a big difference. Because when you look at other parts of the Bible, people may think, Oh, they got it all figured out. No, they trying to. We all trying to please God. So if your life is a life of effort, because that's what it's all about. Me maybe falling down, maybe not. Sometimes you don't even fall. Sometimes you just trip. And I don't know if you know if y'all know about getting old just yet. But sometimes tripping is more scary than falling. Because almost falling is, whew. You know, when you get older, you, whew. <laughs> Ooh. And sometimes it, it hurt because I didn't trip, like just stumbled and pulled something like, ooh, how I do that? I didn't even fall, but it, it hurt. Sometimes you just sleep wrong when you get older. And you hurt for three days. And they say, what's wrong with you? I think I slept wrong on Tuesday. It's Saturday. Saturday is a day of rest because I messed up the rest on Tuesday. So sometimes life can be a little more difficult. But guess what? It's okay. Because life, although difficult, is about you putting forth the effort that God wants you to put forth. And that's to seek my spirit. And as you seek his spirit, those who are around you are going to be influenced by his spirit. But I guarantee you, if you try to fake it, if you try to fake things around here, or out there where okay, it's cool for me to put on this cloak of Christ and then take it off. The first people to notice are your children. Mama, she don't act like that. My mama ain't never been like that. My mama knew. And so they don't act the way the real you act, not the fake you act, because nobody wants to be fake. So in, Psalms 30, in Proverbs 31, 10 through 12, a wife of noble character, who can find? Notice that's a question. Who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. 
Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Of course we want someone like that. But also in Proverbs 31, 23, her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. So if you are with somebody, notice that the husband must be of something too. You can't have a respected woman and notice he didn't say the husband is just sitting at the city gate. He is respected at the city gates, right? And then if we go forward in Proverbs 31, 27 through 30, she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble, noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So notice what it says. Charm is fleeting, right? All these things can go. Charm is deceptive, I'm sorry, and beauty is fleeting, meaning beauty is an eye of the beholder. It can go away. It can come and go. Charm is deceptive. I can use that when I need to. But if you are chasing after the Lord, you fear the Lord, you are worthy of being praised. Her children arise and call her blessed. Why? Because she puts the Lord first. So it starts with this, people. At the end of the day, if you put God first in your life, and that's not hard to do. That just means consulting with him, leaning towards him, putting forth the effort necessary in order to have him in your life. Now, notice I didn't say, hey, make sure you go to church. Make sure you read your Bible. Make sure you pray for 30 minutes every day. I said try. Put forth the effort to seek God first. Sometimes that's going to be reading your Bible. Sometimes it's going to be spending time with him in prayer. Sometimes it's going to be going to church. It's a combination of a lot of different things. But when you keep him first, that means that he is in your heart and he will lead you in what to do. Because sometimes opening your Bible just ain't enough. You don't even know what to read. But seeking him takes on a lot of things. Because a lot of people read the Bible, a lot of people go to church, and a lot of people pray. But a lot of people's lives aren't lining up like that. But when you seek first his spirit, he will lead you to where he wants you to go. And when you get there, you will notice the impact and influence that it has on your children, on those that are around you, and most of all, on the decisions that you make. Because you will be blessed. But you notice when you are out there chasing after people and what they want, they will put you in predicaments and things that you never thought possible. You will find yourself asking the question, how did I get here? And always remember, people are fleeting. So if you seek first people first, some of y'all are in high school and some of y'all remember high school. Think about all the decisions that you made because of the people in that building. You, how you dressed was influenced by those people. Where you went sometimes was influenced by those people. How you acted was influenced by those people. And based upon that, your grades were impacted. Your presence was impacted. Your character was impacted. And all the things that could have been had you made some different decisions based upon the people that were in that building. And here's the ultimate question. Those people that influenced you back then so much, where are they? Do you know them? Do you even have recollection of where they are or what they are doing now? If it wasn't for social media, would you even have any contact with them? But they influenced you a lot, didn't they? It's the same way today. There are people in your life now because you work a certain place that have a lot to do with what you need to do and how you need to talk and what your husband and wife and all this stuff. But change jobs and see how long that contact lasts. There are so many relationships that are out of convenience. God is not one of them. Amen. I just had to stop. I just had to stop. Um, what God wants from us is, is so important, you know, and I just want to make sure that you can get it. That's ultimately what it is. What I want doesn't matter. What people want don't matter. But it's what God wants of you. And if you can figure that out to be after his heart, man, you
you can do so much. I, I just, you can see it. It doesn't take a lot to get a lot because God is everything. So once you start following him and following those footsteps and he make it easy, there's nothing easier than following some footsteps. Notice that, right? If I leave some footsteps in the snow and say, hey, go that way, you may can't see the person, but you see them footsteps. Oh, okay, I'm just going to follow these footsteps. Man, that, I can't get much simpler than that. Follow his steps, and they will lead you to greatness, greatness that you will be amazed that you ever had, right? You didn't even know you had it in you, but it was in there as soon as you accepted him into your life.